Hey everybody, in this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about ch 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 changes <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. That's right, we're talking about Enterprise, episode 3 of season 3, Extinction. This episode dropped on September 24th, 2003. Why does that matter? The original air date? Well, here on Trek in Time, we talk about each and every episode in chronological order, but we also talk about the era in which the episode dropped. So we'll be talking about 2003. In fact, we'll be talking about September 24th, 2003. And with me, as usual, is my brother. Who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And who is Matt? Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So between me with the storytelling and him with the techifying, we got a little bit of the trekifying. Matt, how are you doing today? <laughs> Very good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. It's a lovely, lovely weekend here in the New York City area. I'm very excited to say I went to a beach. It was beautiful. Nice. It was lovely. So I'm all beachified. I feel like a changed man, which is appropriate given this episode. That's right. <laughs> Matt, before we get into the new episode, did you want to share any comments from our previous ones? Yeah, there was a few comments. One was from Karen Collette on the last episode where I brought up a book series about Black Jack Geary because I brought it up because the we were talking about the fight sequence between the two ships being like a submarine battle. Yeah. And I brought up this science fiction book series because it portrays space battles in what I think is the most realistic way possible. And she wrote, Karen Collette wrote, Black Jack what? <laughs> Good <laughs> and question. the character's Black Jack yeah, the character is Black Jack Geary, but the book series is called The Lost Fleet. So if you look that up, whole series of books behind it. There's been spinoff series that he did. The author, the it's under the name um, Jack Campbell, but that's a pseudonym. I think his name is Jack Hemry is his actual name. Mm -hmm. Former Navy general or admiral or something. But it's it's a, it's an interesting book series. I wouldn't say it's an A grade sci-fi. I'd say it's probably B grade. There's a lot of repetition. Like rehashing what happened in the book that you just finished reading because he wrote every book like it was the first time you picked up that book so there's a lot of mm. a lot of wait okay you just spent way too much time rehashing what i just read in the previous book why are you doing this mm. <laughs> but the other comments i wanted to bring up from episode from our episode number 51 which was about the zindi which was the first episode of season three ashaman ranjan i hope i didn't just butcher your name he wrote, I don't think people understand why the Vulcans were as shitty as they were. In my opinion, their crappy portrayal was intentional by the writers. Until the teachings of Sirach were revealed in season four, Vulcans were supposed to be egotistical, condescending, and hypocritical people. Their dedication to logic was supposed to be a farce, and they simply used that excuse to maintain a double standard. Mm. It's just like how the dictators in countries like North Korea maintain a farce of pr prosperity and strength, when in reality, they have serious underlying hidden issues. The breed of Vulcans in the 24th century are a result of Sirach's writings. Every Vulcan before that was supposed to be a twisted version of those lost teachings. And I wanted to bring that up because, yes, it's 100% correct. It actually is very deliberate why the Vulcans are, aren't the Vulcans that we know of mm -hmm. from the Star Trek we're used to. Because this is before that <laughs> epiphany the Vulcans had and yes. found their way back to the right path. So I wanted to bring that up. The last comment was from... Uh, episode 45 of our show and it was about the episode the breach from season two, uh, season two from charles fernandez i know the constructive criticisms come from a place of love and passion this is to you and me sean mm -hmm. uh, never hold back but do evaluate if a particular point of view is coming from thoughtful positive analysis or just plain entitlement complaint mm. thank you for your time and i wanted to bring this up because you and i have talked uh, like off the show about how like we are in season two was kind of like we were like really bagging on that show and I was feeling pretty bad about it because I genuinely like Enterprise. Yep. But season two for me was a slog and it's one of those I would almost recommend just skipping it. And like if you just want to go in at the end of season two into season three, that's probably the best place to start because that's when the show actually gets its stride. Yeah. But we in I think for us, I would say we should probably take that to heart and like when we're giving our constructive criticisms, we might want to express whether this is coming from a place of admiration or genuine, we think this show screwed up and we don't like this. And yeah. Here's how it could have been better. Yeah. That's a very good point. Thank you for that, Charles. And timely, as that read alert in the background, well, Matt, that means that it's time for you to hit the 
Wikipedia description for this episode. You want to head in? Oh boy. Sure. Extinction is the 55th episode of the American science fiction television series, Star Trek Enterprise, the third episode of season three. It first aired on September 24th, 2003 on the UPN network in the United States. This was the first episode to include the prefix Star Trek in the title of the series. Set in the 22nd century, just prior to the formation of the United Federation of Planets, the series follows the adventures of Starfleet's first Warp 5 starship, Enterprise. Registration NX-01. <laughs> We're not even to the description of the episode yet. <laughs> Season 3 of Enterprise features an ongoing story following an attack on Earth by a previously unknown alien race called the Zindi. In this episode, while investigating a planet visited by the Zindi, several crew members, including Captain Jonathan Archer, become infected with a virus that mutates them into another species. The crew of the Enterprise must prevent an alien race from exterminating the mutated crew members while developing a cure themselves. The episode was written by story editor Andre Bormanis and directed by Star Trek The Next Generation alumni LeVar Burton. That's right. Mr. LeVar Burton. This is, according to some counts, like around the 20th episode within Star Trek that he would have directed. He was a director through voyager he's directed episodes of enterprise before so at this point now he's one of their most experienced directors i think that this episode mm -hmm. once again every time we look at a lavar burton directed episode i'm left thinking like this guy really knows what he's doing behind the camera no yep. questions about setting up shots the very populated world of the the planet that they're that they're on and what i mean by populated it is a dense jungle where you never feel like you're just seeing it. It doesn't feel like that episode of Scooby-Doo where they passed the same rock three times. Mm -hmm. This I'm sure was a soundstage that had confines, but I never felt like we were seeing exactly the same corners again and again and again. So I yeah, was me, very me impressed too. by that. And as Matt just said, it was written by Andre Baranis, who started as a uh, science and technology advisor on the show. He moved on to being a writer I think uh, to give a sense of where I'm coming to this episode from, I think that the hard science aspects of this are for me, some of the most compelling parts of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the impact of a virus, which is encoded to do what it is doing to the crew is a hard science puzzle that just, I find fascinating. So that is, it's understandable why he would be behind the words as we mentioned before, this episode dropped on September 24th, 2003, and it included guest appearances from Roger Cross as Tret. He's the main uh, extermination officer who is showing up to basically say to the Enterprise, sorry about your crew members who are infected, but I'm here to kill them. We also see Daniel Day Kim again as Corporal Chang. I do not believe he's had a line in this episode, but he did have a couple of lines in a previous episode. But of course, Daniel Day Kim goes on to be in the series Lost. And also in this episode, Troy Matadler, Philip Boyd, and Brian J. Williams. So on September 24th, 2003, when this episode originally dropped, what were we doing? Well, Matt was dancing and he was dancing very, very enthusiastically to the song. Where is the love by the black eyed peas? Matt could not get enough of that song. I have very fond memories of him coming into the, into the family room and just screaming, listen to this song again, and then just tearing it up the floor with, with his excited dancing. I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in the movie theaters, well, I th here's one we all probably do remember. Underworld made its premiere. It made $21 million in its, in its debut. And for those who do not know it, Underworld is a 2003 action horror film directed by Len Weissman and written by Danny McBride based on a story by Kevin Grugeau, Weissman, and McBride. And it centers on, well, vampires, werewolves, secret wars, cabals, intrigue love sex death you name it and all with michael sheen shane broly and bill nye involved so they are fun movies for the most part the first yeah, one in particular is a fun movie they kind of get worse as they go on but they go downhill they go downhill, they go downhill. but uh kate beckinsale is the lead and she's great to watch in a very tight leather cat suit so check it out if you can find it it's usually broadcasting somewhere usually on something like Tubi or Pluto TV 
And on television, what was Enterprise competing against? Well, as usual, it was competing against my wife and kids. I'm not saying that directly as myself. I'm talking about the program, (laughs) which earned 13 million viewers. 60 Minutes 2 was getting 10 million viewers. On Fox, there was a mysterious program known only as Performing Performing As. I do not know what this is. We'll give bonus points to any one of our listeners who can, in the comments, provide us with information as to what performing as was. It had 6 million viewers. Ed on NBC had 10 million. And on WB, there was a Hillary Duff Island birthday bash, which got 2.3 million viewers, which is a little more than half of what Enterprise got for this episode at 4 million. And in the news from the New York Times on September 24th, 2003, At the United Nations, President Bush had just spoken, and this article demonstrates where we were as both a nation and as a world post the Iraq invasion and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. An audience unmoved. A president who has led his forces to victory, ostensibly on behalf of the United Nations, would in theory deserve a hero's welcome. But that was not what President Bush encountered in an icy chamber here today, almost five months after he declared an end to major hostilities in Iraq. Without apology, Mr. Bush Bush declared that the Security Council had been, quote, right to demand that Iraq destroy its illegal weapons and prove that it had done so, and right to vow serious consequences if Iraq refused to comply, close quote. The United States, he said, had not only unseated Saddam Hussein, but also defended the credibility of the United Nations. But that was not how others, from the Secretary General of the United Nations to the French president, saw it. The invasion of Iraq to them remained a dangerous act of unilateralism, now beset by intractable, intractable problems. I chose that article as the news of the day for this episode, because I think it does cross nicely into one of the aspects of this show. The episode, if you snipped off the first and the last 30 seconds of the show, it is Mm -hmm. just a typical Star Trek episode of Star Trek crew getting turned into aliens. That's a pretty reliable staple for all Star Trek programs. Hey, what's this planet all about? Hey, what happened to my friend? Why does he look like that now? Oh my God, he's an alien. How do we solve mm-hmm. this problem? We've seen this before. But at the beginning and the end of the episode, we're reminded this is about their pursuit of the Zindi. They are here for a reason. They have a calling to go and stop what is going to be an extermination of all life on Earth. So with those bookend reminders of what's going on in the story, I thought that this news story had a certain amount of resonance. Your intentions, your desires to do something, your calling to something that you see as right and justified. And afterward, when the dust settles, you don't get to pick how people interpret it. You yep. will be judged just like you are judging somebody on what you say are the merits of their actions, you will be judged on yours. And so this news story, which demonstrated that as recent as just five months after the end of the Iraq war, the second guessing had begun. The second guessing had begun. I remember very clearly prior to the invasion, even starting there were, there was a large debate going on about what is the goal here? How is this? Okay. Now, here we are worldwide, the rest of the world looking at the United States and saying, you just did something because you wanted to do it. And the reasons and the arguments for or against none of that mattered. You wanted to do a thing and you were going to do it. And so back on the enterprise, back in the, in the story that we're going to be talking about today, the reason that the enterprise is in this sector of space is entirely because they feel justified in going out to find the Zindi to stop the Zindi from exterminating life on earth. And then as no direct result of that, they have this adventure. They have this story. They pursue a Zindi ship to the planet and they come across Well, nothing. There's nothing there. We've seen in the teaser at the beginning of the episode, we see an individual getting burned alive in what seems like a horrific moment. Yeah. And then we see the Enterprise crew finding the same spot now weeks later. 
and then changes start to happen. So we very quickly move from, hmm, the Zindi might be here or evidence of the Zindi might be here to something's happening to our crew. And that from that point on, the episode follows a path very familiar to us. But at this, I was going to say, you can extend your example of why you chose that article for this episode to the alien species they come across that basically is going to exterminate the mutated crew. Yes. They're, they've taken it upon themselves to be basically the defenders of the galaxy from this disease, and they will just obliterate anybody because they feel justified that it's their role that they can come in here and mm -hmm. just wipe people out to prevent another outbreak. Yes. So it's like they're kind of doing a unilateral thing too. So it applies to what we're seeing from both sides, how the enterprise got there, as well as how the enterprise is treated by this other species that comes in. Yes. Um, I, I did one of my, I only wrote a couple notes for this episode because just in general, I want to say, I like this episode. I had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really well, I thought it was well written, well shot. And I especially liked the way it was shot because that opening was pretty damn gruesome. Like you don't see anything. You do not see anything because you don't have to. It's just a bunch of guys surrounding him, lighting up their torches and then flames. Yeah. And it's like you can, your imagination fills in of the, oh my God, they're burning this man alive. Yes. That is a horror show. Yeah. And I thought it was very effective directing by LeVar Burton yeah. of leave it to the viewer's imagination. We don't have to show a thing. Yeah. There was actually a note in my research that I found, which was Scott Bakula talking about the making of this episode. And how much fun they had working with LeVar Burton, but how excited LeVar Burton was about the flamethrowers, which I thought <laughs> <laughs> nice little, uh, factoid there that LeVar likes the fire. So I want to take your note about, you can extend the analysis of that news article to the, the people who are trying to just, uh, you know, exterminate anybody who's infected. I mm -hmm. want to take it one step further and say that this episode largely seems to be about short sightedness in action. Yeah. In, and then laying that at the feet at the very end in front of Archer in particular, but the enterprise in general, the question of is your action thought through enough or are you coming to it from a place where you've taken the most expedient route to a solution and you're not thinking about justifications. And I apply that not only to the extermination attempts of Tret and the, and the species that he's from, but the species that created this virus in the first place, they saw yep. a problem, which was they through whatever evolutionary stages they had gone through, they were losing the ability to procreate. So they came up with a solution and that solution was a virus that would take any humanoid and rewrite the DNA to allow it to transition into a member of their species. And one of the questions that is posed within the episode was why would they not engineer this virus to turn itself off after enough of a population yeah. had been generated again, short sightedness, the ends justify the means we need to survive as a species. So therefore we are going to take this drastic step and effectively unleash a destructive virus upon the galaxy. And it is presented in a way that there's no clear indication that this was anything close to a spacefaring species. In fact, I would yeah. think that this is very likely if you were to go into whatever show notes they might have had about the history of this planet, it wouldn't surprise me if this would be a pre-space exploring species that had come to this solution in isolation, that for them, there was no greater danger to anybody else, that they may have been looking at this as, well, there are humanoid enough other species on our planet that by using these lesser versions of humanoids on our planet as the hosts for this virus, we can keep our culture alive. And then the moment that accidentally some spacefaring race visits this planet and suddenly it jumps ship effectively, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes the problem. I think all of that is the sign of a really 
a strong episode when it makes you on your own think not about solutions to problems within the show, but makes you think about the prehistory of the show, yeah. of the story. How would this culture have evolved this? What would their goals have been? How would they, how would this have worked? I'm also fascinated by, from a hard science aspect, this is making some very interesting statements about memory and about how the mind works because the virus like is able the genetic yeah, memory, the genetic memory yeah. that the, that the crewmen are able to understand. They have a drive to do a thing. They're able to communicate with each other. They have a different language. There's the physicality of the changes, which is one thing that Star Trek has done a number of different times of here comes this physical change. And we almost take that for granted that that is a doable thing. But here is also the idea that within us, memory is somehow a thing. There is a hard thing there. Is memory held within DNA? There are, I've read about theories about memory production that includes a physicality to it. There must be a physical component to memory. So this is at play here. And I think that's fascinating. And for me, and you've, you've already mentioned in your response that you really liked this episode. I liked it too. I liked it too, almost in spite of what felt like some B grade monster movie oh, yeah. isms. Oh yeah. Uh, this is a little bit like the thing light or it's pulpy. It's yeah. pulpy B sci-fi yeah. at times. Yeah. And there's, it's totally fine. Cause it's enjoyable. Yeah. It's enjoyable. It's like, you're having a good time. It's like a bubble gum popcorn, yeah. just kind of having fun with it. I also felt like it was very, very interesting that it is a story that is directed by LeVar Burton. It is basically the same story as his episode identity crisis from next generation in which yep. that story is. And we've talked about that before on this podcast, a group of individuals who had visited a now defunct colony site have been infected by something that doesn't get triggered for years. And it's effectively the same story. Once it's get, once it's triggered, it begins to read, write their DNA and they become something alien. And they are driven by that same kind of genetic memory to return to that planet, to go off into the wild where they will live now as members of that species. This is effectively reproduction, reproduction via infection. And that's happening again in this one, although this one is laying out, this is by design through a culture. Mm -hmm. And this one does something that the other episode didn't do. And I couldn't help but wonder, it was LeVar Burton drawn to this in part because it kind of was the flip side of that earlier story. This one revolves so much around looking at this from not the unaffected crew from their perspective in trying to figure out what's happening to our friend and how do we solve this? This is looking at it largely from the infected perspective and their mm -hmm. desire to, we need to do this thing. We need to find our home. We are looking for home and they, we see a little bit of their social interaction. We see a little bit of the hierarchy of like one's in charge. He does it through physical prowess again with the teasing out of what this all means i couldn't help but wonder if it was playing with the idea of the genetic manipulation that's taking place unlocking a more primitive form of this society because it's a very evolved society that we see in the dream sequence and i couldn't help but wonder this is does it begin to unlock a primitive version of these people that over time if they were remained infected would they have evolved effectively into more sophisticated versions because what we see in the episode is archer's mutated version in particular his relationship to to Paul evolves as the story goes on i couldn't help but wonder was there more of an openness evolving a more sophisticated alien evolving in archer and the others as opposed to when they first converted and they were grunting and very animal like what did you think about all that you just hit on something that's my one criticism like there's there's pulpy aspects that you could criticize but i'm not going to because i just had fun with it this is the one aspect that i was kind of like okay this doesn't make a whole lot of sense they're running around like unsophisticated ape-like lizard-like creatures that barely can <laughs> they have, they almost seem to have trouble communicating amongst themselves yeah and yet in the dream sequence it looks like a 
a highly civilized civilization. And it's like, that makes no sense that they would have a virus that would turn something into them in this barbaric state that feels like this doesn't match with what we're seeing over here. So that aspect of it, I thought was the weakest point right. of all of this. And yeah, you could, you could suppose, well, what if that evolution kept going, that, that mutation kept going, would they have evolved to the point where it'd be like what we saw in the vision? Problem is that's not in the text of the show. Yeah. It's like, and if it's not in the text of the show, it doesn't happen. So it's like, I, for me, that's the one weak point that they, I think they shouldn't have made them as barbaric as they were. There should have been a little more walking upright because in the dream sequence, they're all walking around upright like normal human beings, but then they're like scampering around like lizards on the ground doing that crazy, like clicking at each other all the time. And it was like, okay, yeah, you know, let's dial it back a notch. Or if we had seen them slowly start that way and then become more and more upright by the end of the show, right? that would have explained it. You wouldn't even have to say anything, say anything, yeah. just show it. And it's like, but they didn't even do that. The entire time they're there, they're scampering around like little lizard people, yeah. and like click, clicking at each other. It's, it's, it was that to me, that was the weakest point. But to take our, that comment I brought up earlier, I still liked this episode. I thought it was still fun. Yeah. And even though I'm criticizing that one aspect of it, it was a minor nitpick because I kind of, I very easily kind of hand waved that because I was enjoying the message of the show and what they were trying to say. And I think they succeeded at the message they were trying to deliver, even with that, like, little gotcha yeah i for me i'm curious to the listeners i think that's a place for the listeners to jump in uh you can find the contact information in the podcast description or on youtube you can just go believe below the video and jump in the comment section did you see evidence of what matt and i are talking about was was there a point where you were like oh their evolution is continuing they are getting more and more sophisticated or like Matt just said, do you think there's nothing on the screen to show that? So therefore it's not happening. I find myself thinking there are touches of it. It's maybe not underlined enough. Hmm. You know, something you mentioned, you wouldn't even have to say something. I think maybe you could have a moment where to Paul might recognize, like I'm, I'm apparently having an easier time communicating with captain Archer than I was before. Like something is happening. His, his change is continuing in a very subtle way, but it's there. Mm -hmm. I think that that would have been something that could have been interesting. One of the things I wanted to point out as well, mentioning to Paul, I think her depiction within this is really fascinating because she is affected by the virus, but she is not mutated by it in the same way. And you can see yeah. her struggle with it in certain aspects and certain scenes where she exhibits a bit of fear and she exhibits a bit, a bit of hesitation and concern in ways that don't seem particularly Vulcan like, but I took them in as she is wrestling with some aspect of this that is driving the same sort of animalistic behavior that is evident in her crewmates, but it's not affecting her in quite the same way. And I thought that that was a nice touch. I do want to bring up something about Jolene Blaylock. I really, you can kind of look at her and say she was cast because she's a pretty face, but again and again, there's so many episodes like this one where I think she does such a phenomenal job. You can tell she didn't get this job because she's a pretty face. She got this job because she's also a very capable actress and she did a fantastic job portraying that. I like the, you could see her wrestling with her Vulcanness and what was happening to her. Yeah. And so it was kind of unlocking that emotion and she was struggling with that the entire episode. So she was a little unhinged. The yeah. Entire time. She seemed a little really manic at points and it was really yeah. quite fascinating to see her struggling yeah. in that way. And it, and for it to come across as a kind of mania where when she finally comes yeah. across a uh, trip, when he shows up and he's wearing his, his exosuit so that he can safely be on the planet and it's not affecting him. And she just yells at him, like, I'm staying here. Like you need to get back and, runs and then away. runs away. <laughs> and the way she did that was with this kind of like any other moment in the series, she would have stopped for a moment, given him clear instructions and explanations as to why, and then disappeared into the jungle. But this was yep. a kind of animal to Paul who was just like, uh, I gotta go. And then took off. And I really, <laughs> I thought that it was made a Kramer sense. performance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she came out of the room where the, K the Kenny Rogers roasters lights were frying his brain. <laughs> yes. So the culmination of this episode is once again, you know, 
miracles of science happen and the doctor is able to utilize to Paul's response to the virus to be able to generate a cure for the virus. And this is all being done under the pressure cooker of the aliens that have shown up and said, good news, we have a solution for this. You just exterminate anybody who's infected and then you don't have to worry about it. The doctor's pushback of like, let give me more time. And the enterprise is struggling with like, we need more time. We're trying to solve this problem. And the alien response being this, just burn it to the ground and then you don't have to worry about it. Finally, at the end of the episode, it works. They're able to reclaim their crewmates. They have the now semi returning to normal crew, including Captain Archer, show up on the bridge to talk to the members of this hunting party to say, like, look, you can see we're getting better. We can share this with you. This doesn't have to be treated the way it's being treated. And we see at the very, very end, we now have the, the, the book ending that I was talking about earlier in the episode where Phlox has the last remaining parts of the virus and says offhandedly, I'm sure you want me to destroy this. This is, you know, it's a tragic story about these people who are gone, but this virus is dangerous if it's allowed to exist. And Archer orders him to keep it in stasis under the belief that somehow the last remaining piece of an entire culture lives within the virus and that to destroy it would be to do something as harmful as what the Zindi appear to be doing in their desire to destroy earth. Mm Mm-hmm. This response at the end of the episode in a lot of critical response to this episode was that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's dumb. It it's kind of a, a strange note to end on. Some people thought I agree to a certain point that I felt like, okay, this, that felt like it came a little bit out of nowhere, but at the same time, I felt like there were two things going on. One, they gave this, a a note that's very similar to the episode from next generation where picard has his entire lived experience of an entire life via the alien probe yeah that satellite where yeah. he he lives an entire life that is artificially induced in him but at the end of it the experience of it was so real that he mourns the loss of the people that he had grown to know and love. He mourns the loss of a family he never actually had. And he leaves that episode with the ability to play the flute. And it became that flute became for the show, a reminder of Picard's personal growth. It became for me in watching next generation, whenever that flute makes an appearance, it's a reminder. Like this is not the same Picard from the pilot. This is a Picard who's more human than he was when he started the show. And he's lived two lives. He lived two (laughs) lives. And I think that this was a little bit of an attempt to touch on that in a very brief way of, of captain Archer looking at this and saying like, I lived a, I lived a life in those few hours, which was about the desire for salvation and survival, no different than what I'm doing now. And He sees at a certain moment in the story when they are mutated, when they find the devastation of the underground city that they believe is their salvation and they see how it's gone and it's been gone for generations and the, the mourning that he goes through the mourning and despair that he goes through is no different than what happened after the attack on earth by the Zindi. So he leaves this with this kind of reaffirmation of the rightness and wrongness of what they're doing out there and what the Zindi have done. And I would like to think that at this moment, this is the beginning of a turning point for Archer in raising the question of is the solution to earth's problem to exterminate the enemy? I, for me, do you, do you think that's a strong message though in this? Because that ending to me felt kind of ham fisted and kind of rushed. And it was like trying to put weight on something that didn't belong there. 
I like absolutely it agree. Sense. Yeah, I absolutely agree yeah. that it felt ham fisted in the moment. But I think that what they were trying to do was plant that seed of there's now a crack in his very hard shell from the first couple of episodes of the season where he's moving forward with a determination around, we have a job to do. We're not going to stop. We're, we're going to, we're going to do whatever it takes. But he, at the end of this episode, there seems to be a stronger whiff of humanity in him and empathy in him than we've seen in the first couple episodes. And I, for me, that feels like it's there because they felt like this was the place to start that transition away from, I'm going to burn everything to the ground to make sure earth is safe. So Mm -hmm. while I don't think that this is necessarily the best way for them to have planted that seed, I do think that this is that seed. Mm -hmm. So here we are. I feel like at the end, it's, it's important to kind of like wrap everything up and give a summary of our thoughts. And I, and for me, like I mentioned earlier, I enjoyed this episode. It felt like a fun adventure for me in veins of next generation episodes, like the, the classic, like what's happening to my crew. Like it's, it's a staple for a reason. It works. And it works. in this particular episode, the makeup that they put on three actors that never really, really went good. through makeup like that, the descriptions I found online included five hours of makeup prep. The actor who plays Lieutenant Reed gave a shout out to Billingsley, who plays Fox, saying he has to do this every day. And I take my hat off to him because this was really an arduous process for, for all of them. And the makeup included air bladders around their necks that they were able to manipulate that lended whenever they would growl, you would see these air bladders pulsate. And I mean, you want to create, you know, a simple lizard person, or you want to create something with air bladders, you go the air bladder route, Matt, every single time. It was very effective. It was very effective. Very effective. So simple, but effective. Yeah. So I do want to say that, When I watch these episodes, I'm taking notes on my iPad to talk about. And on this one, I found myself focused on the episode. And by the time I realized I haven't really taken many notes, the episode was over. Yeah, (laughs) it was. I got engrossed in it. So for me, even with some of the flaws and the the you know B level sci fi ness to some of it, I didn't care. Yeah, I was having fun. I got engrossed. I enjoyed myself. It was. I, I like this one. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a good time. So before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you want to let our listeners know about? What do you have coming up on your other channel? Yeah, you should check out Undecided this week. Um, I'm talking about edible plastic. Edible plastic. Sounds like a topic you can really sink your teeth into. As for me, you can go to seanfarrell.com. You can find out information about my books there, or you can just go to your local bookstore, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, small bookstores, or public libraries. All of those places will be able to get hold of my writing. And if you'd like to support the show, you can keep doing what you're doing right now using your ears. You can also leave a review on Apple or Google or Spotify, wherever it is that you found this podcast or on YouTube. You can just like, and subscribe right there. If you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show. There's a become a supporter button there. Allows you to do two things. First, it'll throw coins at our heads and we appreciate the bruises. And second, it will make you a cadet. You will be signed up for automatically our out of time show, which will come into your feed because of being a direct supporter. All of these really do help support the show. Thank you so much for listening or watching and we'll talk to you next time.